Amen. I want you to just take a moment and just tell God who he is to you. Amen. Just tell him, tell him who he is to you. Because it's always about making it personal between you and God. So I just want you to take a moment and remind God who he is to you. I know that he's a way maker. Amen. The songwriter said he's a miracle worker. Amen. We know that he keeps every promise that he makes. But I want you to make it personal and tell him, don't tell me, tell him what he is to you. What do you need God to be in your life right now? What deficit exists that he's looking to fill, fill the gap on? You are love to me, God. You are peace to me, God. In the midst of what seems to be the greatest storm of my life, God, you are, you are peace. Right in the midst of the adversity that I deal with, God. Right in the place where I feel like I'm being held captive, God. You, you are my rescue. Yeah. Right in the place where I feel like I'm being held back the most, God. I declare you to be, you to be my rescue. Yeah. In all my anxiety, God, I declare you to be my peace. As sickness goes through my body, God, I declare you to be, I declare you to be my healer. You shouldn't be quiet in this moment. This is the moment where you begin to tell God what he is to you. My deliverance. Thank you, Father. My joy. Because some days I feel like the enemy's trying to strip me of the joy, but God, you are my joy today, Father. And when the overwhelming amount of hate comes my way, God, I feel your love. The Bible says, uh, the songwriter says, love lifted me. Yeah. Out of the hole that I was in, love, your love, God, it lifted me. And to every wavy and unstable place, God, you, I declare you to be my stability. You stabilize the most uneven parts of my life, God. You bring the stability, Father. In the places where I've been blind, God, you, you become my vision, Father. You are what I look to, Father. You are what I see, Father. When I see adversity, when I see affliction, God, you are what I see now, God. Where there was darkness, God, I declare, you are the light that I'm looking for, Father. Your word. Your word, Father. You are a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Father. You that's what you are for me. Uh, that's what you are for me, God. Now, don't miss your moment. Don't forget to tell God what he is for you. Don't forget to declare who he is for you. Don't forget to remind as you confess the testimony of your testing who God is and how he showed up. This is your moment to remind him. This is the praise that you release. This is the sound that you will release right now. Amen. Amen. You remain silent too long and Sometimes, amen, thank you, Holy Spirit. Sometimes you being able to declare who he is, 
isn't just that you would remind God of who he is because he knows who he is. But sometimes you opening your mouth and declaring who he is reminds you, my God, it reminds you of who he is. And sometimes, sometimes your spirit needs to hear what you're speaking so that it knows what's going on. My God, it ain't just about God. God already knows who he is. He said, I'm the great I am. But sometimes what you're dealing with on the inside needs to be reminded of what you're declaring from your mouth so that your spirit can hear what's being spoken over you. Amen. Somebody say amen. 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 I know. Amen. Who's praying with me today? Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell y'all the enemy was, enemy been busy. My God. My God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. When, when you have these moments where you feel like uh, the opposition is the greatest, uh, these are not the moments to lean into the opposition. Uh, this is the moment where you begin to look for how God is going to show himself strong in these moments. Amen. So we've had Amen. We were planning for you to be present. Amen. Thank God for thank God for those of you who are in the house. Amen. The, the rest of you, I'm looking for you. And so Claxton said to me, he said, he said, bro, I think, and I'm going to just give you guys my thought process. Since we're late, I'm going to take my time. Amen. 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 He said, he said, he said, bro, maybe we should, my wife said the same thing. Uh, maybe we should have had a bigger appeal for people to return. And I struggled with it because I in my spirit, I feel like we are already connected to what's going on. So why do you need a special invite when there's an open door? Amen. I'm sorry. I don't know why you need a special invite when there's already an open door. So if, if we like that, if we're like that, amen. If you like that with God, let me help you out. If you like that with God. But I'll make it personal. If you like that with me, you can drop by my crib whenever you want. Amen. 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 Everybody in this room has just has been by my house because you already understand that the door is open. Amen. So I've been saying the same thing week over week for the last six weeks. We're going to be we're going to be back in person the second week of October. What week is this? Amen. 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 So I was looking for y'all, those of you who aren't here. Amen. Just know that I was looking for you. And I'm sorry that uh, you had to wait for us today. Amen. But, but had you been here, you wouldn't have to wait. Amen. Amen. God is good. But we, we had a lot of opposition in preparing for you to be present. Notice I had to, I had to shift my angle, which means we had to we had to change a lot of things, and, and so uh, it presented some challenges. Uh, and then our normal streaming device uh, came up missing. Amen. I'm going to just say it like that. It came up missing. Amen. So we had to download, and we had to do all these things. And so uh, we just thank God for your uh, patience and, and the grace that you've extended to us today. Amen. I told my mom, I said, I've been inviting them to come to come to the building to have communion with us for the last four months. Amen. So some of y'all just need to get in the routine of things uh, so that you don't because I'm not. Hey, let me say it like this. I'm not creating a flyer to remind you to be present in a place where God is already looking for you to be. Amen. Just because you shift the location of where it happens, it's still happening. Amen. So, so, so if you need a special invite, you're invited. I'll see you next week. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Ezra. Ezra. Uh, Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. And so some of you who have not been in Bible class, am I, am I beating up on y'all a little bit? Forgive me because that's not my intention. Amen. I'm going to say it this way. Amen. In Bible class, we've been discussing, um, we've been in Deuteronomy, well, I think we just finished chapter 6, 
on Tuesday. Did we go to seven? Okay, we stopped at six. And before I can get to seven, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this word. God gave this to me. When I tell you this morning, my wife will confirm that it was this morning that God gave it to me. Um, and I think it's important. And I'll be quick because I still have to serve the Lord's Supper, so I won't finish today. Amen. I'm going to have to finish next week. I love these messages when I can't finish. Amen. By the way, uh, Ezra chapter 9. Ezra has this incredible assignment. Ezra has an incredible assignment. If you're looking for it, uh, it's just after First and Second Chronicles. Amen. Ezra, E-Z-R-A, chapter 9. Amen. Those of you who are not as familiar with us in Bible country, we want to make sure that you are aware of where we are. Amen. Ezra chapter 9. I am in the New Living Translation uh, today, and um, you'll, you'll find here that Ezra has this incredible assignment. Amen. He has this incredible assignment. He finds himself uh, in this very interesting space, um, trying to bring many of the Israelites back to Jerusalem after 70 years of exile. Amen. Uh, the Israelites had found themselves in a position where they were outside of God's will uh, and outside of God's specified holy place for them. Amen. And so what he's doing, he, he begins to talk about uh, getting them back to this place. And so in chapter 9, what uh, what what Ezra begins to do, he begins to intercede for these people. I thought this part was important because uh, as we get ready to go into chapter 7 in Bible class in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, it's important that we look at what's happening here. Chapter 9 says, and when these things had been done, uh, the Jewish leaders came to me, amen, the Jewish leaders came to me and said, uh, many of the people of Israel and even some of the priests and Levites, uh, they've not kept themselves separate from uh, the other people living in the land. I'm going to pause there because what we've been talking about in Bible class uh, is this uh, really important warning that God has been giving to his people. Amen. His people, you, his people. Uh, this very incredible warning that he's been giving to them, uh, and I believe that this part is true, that many of us are on the brink of entering into a new season. Amen. Amen. We are on the brink of entering into what God has promised them. He said, uh, you are about to enter into the land that I promised your fathers. There's a blessing that God has spoken uh, that is now uh, moving down to generation, and you happen to be living in a season and in a time where uh, the blessing of God is falling upon you. Okay? There were things that were promised to your parents. Uh, there were things that were promised to your grandparents and even maybe your great-grandparents that you are now the benefactor of. You are now about to walk into uh, your new place. But before you walk into your new place, before you walk into your new season, before you inherit uh, the promise of God, God had laid out uh, the expectations of you prior to walking into this place. We recognize that some of our ancestors did not walk into this place uh, mostly because uh, they uh, walked away from what God had spoken in terms of what his expectations were. Uh, the terms and the conditions of the assignment were not kept. And so I ask you the question today, what are the terms and the conditions of the assignment that God is giving you in this season that it is uh, absolutely imperative that you adhere to so that you don't forfeit your opportunity to walk into your promise? We sing songs like, God, you are a promise keeper and you are a way maker and that you do all these incredible things, that you do everything well and that you never fail. But what is our responsibility to the promise that you've made toward us? There is a promise that you've made. There is a thing that you've spoken, but there is also the expectation that's connected to the promise. So the expectation that's connected to the promise is an expectation that is laid out for you and God is looking for you uh, to walk in uh, obedience to what he has spoken. 
So what God said to them was, he said, I, I, I want you to enter into this land. There's a place that God's taking you. And as you get ready to cross the threshold of your new place, I want you to be careful to make sure that you honor me, that you keep my commandments. He went into speaking to them about something that's important. He said, you need to ensure that you're giving me your whole heart. I need your whole soul. And then I need all your strength. Because what God recognizes is as we begin to enter into new spaces, there are things that attempt to consume us and take our attention away from him. So, of course, I like to ask questions. So I ask you the question, who has your attention right now? When you really take survey of the place that you're in and you really begin to think about the things that you believe God for and you really begin to fixate on how you want God to show up and what your future looks like and what life will be like in 20 years. And as you think about the bag that God has promised or the blessings that are going to overflow or the work that you're going to do or the creative streams that are going to be released from you, as you think about all these things that God has promised. The question then becomes, what has your attention? Because God is trying his best to stay in relationship with you. God is trying his best to uh, be the thing that consumes you the most. Uh, but at the same time, God recognizes that there are always things competing for your attention. And the question is, will you allow those things to capture you or will you stay captured by God? So he says to them, before you enter this place, before you can cross the threshold, before, uh, check it this way, before I can release the promise to you, and many of us are waiting, and, and this is what I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me, the assignment of your faith in this season is to wait. I'm going to say it one more time. The assignment of your faith in this season is to wait. And this is the hardest place for believers because, and I've talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, but this is the assignment of your faith in this season is to wait. And, and the reason that you have to be comfortable with waiting is because you don't want to jump ahead of what God is doing. And you don't want to allow yourself to be consumed by something else. And you don't want something else to get your attention because you don't know if you're going to end up in a place where you are exiled for 70 years. And then you are no longer the benefactor and no longer the recipient of the promise. Now you are uh, uh, disconnected from the promise and you have to hope that the next generation catches what God had promised you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So God had given them instruction. He said, I want you to go into the land. I want you to be intentional as you enter into this place. And the instruction that God had given them was that he wanted them to be fruitful and multiply. But he, he didn't want them to stop. And, and this, is where, uh, this is where I left off two weeks ago as we were talking about the Tower of, of Babel and how God had to come down and he had to confuse their language because they lost sight of what God said. And sometimes when you're going through a season where things seem to be confusing for you, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, did I stop doing what God asked me to do? God, I'm confused right here. Why is it this working? God, I'm confused right here. Why am I not progressing beyond this place? God, I'm confused right here. Why aren't the principles working? Why aren't things being released? Why am I not finding myself in motion? And most of it has to do with the fact that you stopped listening to what God said and you decided to do what you wanted to do. So God came down. He had to confuse their language because he needed to ensure that they understood what the assignment was. And the assignment of your faith in this season, man and woman of God, is for you to wait on what God says to you next. Because he is the one that's giving the instruction. He's the one that is the author of what we are walking out in life. He's, he's the one that's in total control. So if God is the author of the story that we're living, it's important for us to wait for the next written part for us to know what we say and do in this new space 
So God is like, yo, there's a promise. I'm trying to allow you to cross into a threshold of a new season. That's what you need to remember, that you are entering into a new season. There is a place of promise for you. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. God's desire is for you to live in a place of overflow and abundance. That's God's desire. That's what he said. As they scouted out the land, he said, yo, you're going to enter into a place. This is what it looks like. And if you uh, walk in obedience, there's nothing that the Bible says, uh, no good thing will I withhold from them that walk upright. I, I, I keep trying to teach you what God is saying so that you don't miss it, but all of it is connected. There's no good thing that I withhold from them if they keep doing what I said. But if you stop doing what I say, then I withhold everything. My God. Okay. So Ezra finds himself in this incredible assignment in this season. Ezra's job in this moment is to intercede. He said, when all these things had been done, verse, verse 1 of chapter 9, when all these things had been done, the Jewish leaders came to me and said, many of the people of Israel and even some of the priests and the Levites have not kept. Woo. This is, this is important because the responsibility is on them. It says they have not kept themselves separate from the other people living in the land. Pause. People of God, it's important that you keep yourself separate from the other people living in the land. The Bible says it this way. Come ye out from among them. Amen. And be ye separate from them. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will do what? I will receive you. So God's desire is for you to be connected. God's desire is for you to be in relationship. God's desire is for you to walk into your place of promise, but it's predicated on your accountability to do what? To keep what he has said, and to maintain a separate way of living, and that means you can't do it the way everybody else is doing it. I know y'all dating, but that means y'all can't shack up. I, I, I know you love them, but that means y'all can't, can't sleep together. Amen. I, I, I know that, that you've got all these things that you want to do, but there's, there's a certain way that you have to do it. I, I know that you think it's just a small white lie, but it's a lie nonetheless. I know that what you think and you deem to be this gray area, there's no gray areas with God. So either you're doing it what the way he said do it or you're missing the mark. Now, thank God for grace and mercy because it, it helps us. Amen. So, so he says to them, he said, it's important for us to uh, uh, keep ourselves separate from the people living in the land. It says, it says this here in verse, uh, verse 1, still in verse 1. It says, uh, they have taken up detestable practices of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Prezizites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Amen. My God. They picked up a little of the nonsense from everybody that was around them. Amen. I, I know. And it, this is the thing. This is, this is why we have to be so careful because it looks different for us in this season. And I know that we love social media and it's one of the greatest platforms to advance the kingdom and to share. Amen. I'm using it right now. But what we find in many cases is we're taking in all this messaging and it's literally entering into our spirit. And so if we are not careful to actually and properly filtrate what what's coming in. Then are we actually living separate or are we being entangled and indoctrinated with things that don't look like God. A little bit of this from, from the Hittites, a little bit of this from the Moabites, a little bit of this from the Egyptians. And so we take on all these different philosophies and we believe all these small things. Uh, but the reality is there's only one God. Amen. There's only one and true living God. And so verse 2 says, for the men of Israel have married women from these people, and they have taken uh, them as wives for their sons. Uh, so the holy race has become polluted by these mixed, amen, by these mixed marriages. God was never concerned about you being connected to someone that didn't look like you. 
it wasn't about it wasn't about you marrying somebody that was white or somebody that was black or somebody that was Asian or it wasn't about that. It wasn't about you marrying someone that was of Latin descent. It wasn't about that. It didn't matter that you didn't it didn't matter to God that you married someone that did not look like you. It mattered to God that you married someone that did not believe like you. It matters to God that you don't connect yourselves with someone that doesn't believe the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It matters to God that you don't marry someone who's going to say things to you like there's no such thing as Jesus. It matters to God that you don't marry someone that doesn't, that, that doesn't tell you it's important to maintain your faith. So there was a warning that was given to them. He said, I, I want you to be careful. And what we've already found as the, as the, as the text has, has stated, they started picking up things that didn't look like God. Because they were connecting themselves to people that didn't believe like they believed. So what was once a holy race has now become a race of polluted believers. Woo! A whole race of polluted believers. Because we've allowed ourselves to be connected with people that don't believe like we believe. The Bible says here, worse yet, the leaders and officials have led the way of this outage. So what happened was Moses married someone who didn't believe God the way he believed. Amen. So, so what started happening is people started saying that this was, and this is how the standard becomes weakened. Everybody says, well, so-and-so did it this way, so why can't I do it that way? So-and-so shacked up, and they seem to be all right, but you don't know the hell that they went through in their marriage. Come on now. So-and-so married somebody they didn't believe, but, but she never maximized her faith. Amen. And so this is why it's so critical and so important for us to understand the assignment of our faith in this season is to wait for what God says to you next so that you don't connect yourselves with somebody that doesn't believe like you believe. So now all your promise and all your purpose and all your destiny is now delayed because God can't allow you to take your polluted thought process and your polluted faith into your next season. So there has to be a season where we go through a cleansing in order for us to be able to march ourselves into our place of promise. What will you put down so that you can walk into your promise? He said, when, when I heard this, this is, this is Ezra speaking. When I heard this, I tore my cloak, the cloak of my shirt. I pulled my hair from my head and my beard. I sat down utterly shocked. Then all who trembled at the words of the Lord, uh, the, all of those who trembled at the words of the God of Israel came and they sat with me because of this outrage committed uh, by the returned exiles. This is the thing that I think is so absolutely interesting for us to walk away with. They were no longer in captivity. God had already rescued them and they found themselves still not walking in obedience. So what is it that you've already been delivered from? What is it that God has already rescued you from? What, what uh, 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 spiritual captivity have you been brought out of that you are now teetering on the fence of being locked back into? And the Bible says sometimes when you start dealing with the thing that God has already freed you from, that enemy that you start fighting comes back seven times stronger. So now this itch that you can't seem to get rid of you're trying to figure out why and much of it has to do with God already broke you out of that and you were never supposed to go back to it. So I was shocked. This outrage committed by the returned exiles and I sat there utterly appalled until the time of the evening sacrifice. At the time of the sacrifice, I stood up from where I sat in mourning with my clothes torn. I fell on my knees. I lifted my hands to the Lord my God and I prayed. In this season, you're going to find yourselves praying more than you thought you would. Because the greatest revelation of our faith comes out of prayer. Amen. So if I'm waiting to hear what God says next, I've got to put myself in a position to hear. Where am I going to hear it? It's going to be birthed out of prayer. 
So Ezra finds himself after he recognizes this uh, uh, extremely crazy outrage through his lens because he can't wrap his mind around how somebody who's been delivered would allow themselves to be once again entangled with something that God freed them from. No entanglements in this season, amen. So he does the only thing that he knows to do. He strips his clothes. He falls to his face. The Bible says he begins to pray. This is the prayer of Ezra. And I'm going to, there's a place where I'm going to stop, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to it. He says, oh my God, I am utterly ashamed. I blush to lift my face to you for our sins are piled higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, we have been steeped in sin. This is why we and our kings and our priests have been at the mercy of pagan kings of the land. We have been killed, captured, robbed, and disgraced just as we are today. He, he literally begins to pray a prayer that speaks to the season that they're in and, and, and the anguish that they're feeling, not because God is uh, incapable of giving them the very promise that he, he already laid out, but they recognize that it's a result of what they've allowed themselves to be indoctrinated with. They recognize that this is a result of the place that they've allowed themselves to be in. He said, it's not because you ain't a good God. It's not because you ain't a faithful God. It's not because you aren't well able. We already know that you are. But this thing that we're dealing with right now, it is a result of the sin that we are steeped in. We've been sitting in this. And our sins pile higher than our heads and our guilt has reached the heavens and we are at an all time high in the place that we are in. And now we got to figure out what we do next. So I'm praying. Now I have to figure out how life is going to change. What's going to shift the very thing that I'm dealing with? Something has to give in this moment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Captured by pagan gods and kings. We, we, and this is the thing that, that we have to realize. That God has made us greater than all these things that we are faced with. And these things that try to exalt themselves, and I, and I talked about it when we talked about uh, uh, David slaying Goliath. Your giant is nothing compared to what God is willing to do with the provision that he releases to you for the promise that he's spoken over you. He says this in verse 8, he says, but now we have been given a brief moment of grace. This is the part. I think this is where I'm going to stop. He says, uh, verse 8, but now we have been given a brief moment of grace. For the Lord our God has allowed a few of us to survive as a remnant. Oh, my God. He has given us security in this holy place. Our God has brightened our eyes and granted us some relief from our slavery. Uh, for we were slaves, but his unfailing love, but the unfailing love uh, of our God uh, did not abandon us in our slavery. Instead, he calls the kings of Persia to treat us favorably. He revived us so we could rebuild the temple of the Lord our God and repair its ruins. He has given us a protective wall in Judah and Jerusalem. The Bible says that God has given us, he's granted us some relief in this season. And this is the thing that many of us feel because we, we, we know that the weight of the sin that we've been dealing with by design should have crushed us. Amen. The weight of what we're dealing with by design should have crushed us, but God has given us, he's granted us a, as the Bible says, a brief moment. And this is the part that I want you to hear as I'm, as, I'm, as I'm saying it to you. Your window of opportunity to redeem yourself ain't that long. 
And this is how people miss it. Because they stop looking for the small window that God is opening for them. They stop looking for that, that moment where God is trying to bring them out. And they stop listening to his voice as he says things like, this ain't what you should be doing in this season. Mm. When, when you stop listening to that voice that says, you've done that long enough. You stop listening to the voice that says, you've been in this place far too long and I'm trying to bring you out. You stop listening because the detestable things that you've touched begin to scream louder at you than the voice of God saying, walk away right now. And that's why the assignment of your faith in this season is to wait because you should be waiting to hear what God says next. Then that moment, that brief moment that you get, it is designed so that you are no longer held captive, but that you can be free to rebuild. Oh, my God. As I close, he says this, he says. This is a part that I think is amazing. Everybody doesn't make it out of what they're dealing with. Did you catch that in the word? He said he allowed a few of us. You don't know which side of that you're going to be on. And this is why it's so important that you don't get yourselves locked up in stuff that you can't get yourself out of. Because you don't know who's going to be pardoned. You don't know who's going to get their breakthrough. You don't know who's going to get free. You don't know who's going to be waiting that they're going to be actually able to get through the door. You don't know if it's going to be you or if you're going to be so indulged in what you're dealing with that you never hear what God is saying. So you never get your opportunity to get out of it. Grace of God has allowed a few of us to survive as a remnant. He's letting you come out for his glory. And then he says he's going to give you security in the holy place, not the place you've been hanging out in. But in his holy place. And that is where you will find the security of the father. And that is where your eyes are going to be brightened. And that is where you are going to feel the relief of what you've been dealing with. And that is the place where you're going to experience his unfailing love. And, and that is the moment where you realize that you were not abandoned. And some of us are struggling with abandonment issues uh, because you think God left you and that God forgot about you. But the reality is God didn't leave. You didn't walk through the door when he opened it. So you feel like you were on the outside of what God said. But the reality is you were only on the outside because when it was the moment for you to come through the door, you didn't respond. You didn't say yes. So will you say yes today? Will you say yes today so that you can rebuild? Will you say yes today so that you can rebuild? The weight of what you're dealing with, my God, it'll crush you if you don't trust God enough to respond to his voice when he begins to speak. And so in this season, you have to be absolutely certain that you don't miss the moment where God is saying, this is where you change. This is where you turn. This is where you walk away. Because all of us want to enter into the place of our inheritance. There's a promise that God is like, and this is the thing that I really try to get believers to understand. The Bible says that God's no respecter of person. So I'm, I'm not like, I'm not a prosperity preacher because I, I believe that overflow is available for everybody. The abundance of God, whatever it is that you want, like, because I, I think that stuff doesn't matter to God. That stuff doesn't matter. Like, if you think about it, God's design, think about it. God's desire and the design for God's people was to be in a place where they were never without. What did I teach you in Bible class? He said, I'm taking you to a place 
where you will be able to pull from the vineyards that you didn't plant. You'll reap a harvest from what you didn't sow. I'm just teaching you what the Bible says. You walking around in lack ain't God's plan. That was never his plan. But the only reason that you are without is because you are without him. And whenever you decide that you don't want to be in his presence or you don't want to do it his way, those moments when you've chosen to walk in disobedience are the moment that you've cut off your lifeline. So then you have to make up the difference. And the weight of trying to make up the difference, man, man, it's far greater than what many of us can handle. And that's why we check out. That's why we don't want to serve God. That's why we don't want to walk with him. Because how could a good God let me go through this? But how could, a, how could a good son and daughter not listen to dad? I equate the faithfulness of my children by who listens to me the most. Ain't no favoritism. One's just going to get more out of their obedience. No good thing will I withhold from them. So I look at my four, and, I'm all, and my, my message is the same. Do what I ask. What did I ask you to do? What did I ask you to do? And the moment they don't, the moment their response is something contrary to what I asked, I say, but did I ask you to do that? Now I make you wait. Now you got to wait. Now the thing you want, you can't get because my expectation is that you did what I said. Aubrey, I love you. So who's going to listen? And you can do all these other things. But dad, I cleaned the office. That's not what I asked you to do. Dad, I went outside, I raked the leaves, but that's not what I asked you to do. And until you do what I asked you to do, you will find yourself waiting for the thing that you're looking for me to give. So the thing you're waiting on God to give you is predicated on you doing what God asked you. Your assignment in this season, your faith assignment is to wait. And in that moment while you're waiting, you need to be assessing, God, what you say? Going back through your notes, going back through your dreams, your, all that revelation you got. Hey, what did I miss? Oh, you said don't do that? Okay. Let me go back. Because until we, and this is the thing. God doesn't want to pollute. Hear me your new place with old things. Your new place can't, it can't have all that stuff that you had in your old place. Your new place can't have that. The Bible says this way, you can't pour new wine into old wine skin. Why? Because what happens when you pour the wine in the wine skin, it makes the the wine skin expand. And it can expand beyond a certain point. It can't, go, it can't go beyond what it, what it was designed to do. So then you take old wine skin and you put new wine in it. And then the Bible says that the wine skin will break and you ruin the good wine. If you take your old stuff into a new place, it'll break up your new place. And then everything that you were designed to have, to hold and capture in that moment, lies in waste. So the assignment in this season is to, okay, God, what did you say? What do I need to do? Ezra is interceding so that they don't miss it. This intercession is necessary. But this intercession prompts fasting. Fasting. 